My name is James Cunningham, president of CFG Consulting. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this DVD presentation. If you're watching it, it's because you're currently filling out one of our financial profiles and getting ready to send it back to us. When we receive it, we will create a personalized financial strategy. This presentation is part one. Your personal strategy is part two. But we want to share with you the concept of the family bank before you receive your personalized strategy. The family bank concept will allow you to not only put your house in order, but it will also open up future opportunities for wealth and success. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. I want to begin our discussion with the definition of financial independence. I've had the opportunity to literally speak with thousands of people about money and wealth. And if you talk to most financially independent people, they will tell you that financial independence is having the freedom of mind to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And I agree with that. Most individuals will tell us that having a pool of money large enough to produce an income stream to pay for their wants, needs, and desires is a great definition, and I agree. However, I have seen people lose tremendous amounts of money and wealth because of elements outside their control. Death in the family, a business failure, maybe a rocky stock market, and the list goes on and on for why people can lose their nest eggs. But I would add this to the definition without depleting the pool of money. You see, you can't have true independence or true peace of mind if there is any risk at all of losing everything that you've worked hard to build and save. So in our plan and in our strategies, we want to focus on without depleting the pool of money. And in order to succeed, there's only two things that you need to know, where you are and where you're going. This is why we ask you to establish some goals. Now, you'll see later on that there's a big difference between goal setting and goal achieving. But in order to clarify this and bring order to our minds, I've developed six steps to financial success. They are protecting what you have, taking control of your cash flow, investing wisely, managing your taxes, saving for retirement, and leaving a legacy. These six steps have become so powerful and so successful to so many thousands of people that I've written a book about it called Six Steps to Permanent Personal and Professional Financial Independence. If you haven't had a chance to read it, I encourage you to get a copy. In fact, just for watching this DVD presentation, if you contact the business consultant who you originally spoke with, ask them for a free copy of our ebook version and he or she will be happy to get it out to you. But the message within the book is so powerful that we hope you share it with others. The basis for our financial strategies and understanding is called the family bank. Now, the family bank is not a new concept. In fact, it's been around since about the 1950s. So many people have misunderstood the concept, however, that they haven't been able to take advantage of this very powerful idea of how to make money, save money, and stay out of debt. But it begins with the idea that we are all in the business of banking. It doesn't matter if you work for somebody, if you own your own business, selling a product or service, we are all still in the business of banking. Banks are just like any other business. Their product just happens to be money. Other businesses sell widgets or services. Banks sell money. They do it in the form of loans, certificates of deposits, and other financial products they make money on the interest they charge on loans because that interest is higher than the interest they pay on depositors accounts. But the question we should ask is where do banks get their money? The answer is from us. If this is from us, then how are we involved in their business? You see, each day millions of Americans wake up and go to work. At the end of their work period, they expect a paycheck. And what do they do with this paycheck? Well, that's right, they take it to the bank. They either cash it or they deposit it in their checking or savings account. What rate of return is the average person earning on their savings account? Well, according to USA Today, it is less than 1%. That doesn't even keep up with inflation. So if we need to borrow money, we have to go back to the same bank. And the bank is happy to really lend us our own money if our credit's good enough but they will charge us a much higher rate of return on the loan than what they're giving us on our deposits. 
the bank can easily charge 7 to 24% on a car loan or a house loan or credit cards. Now, this individual gave us an insight to the power of money. He developed a formula for compound interest and he called it the rule of 72. The rule of 72 states, you take the rate of return you're earning on your money, divide that into 72, and that will tell you how many years it takes for your money to double. So let's look at an example. Let's say that you're 30 years old and you've got some money. Let's say it's $1,000 and you find a bank that's willing to give you 3%. At age 30, when you make the deposit, you have $1,000. Well, 3 into 72 is 24. So your money sitting in that account will grow every 24 years or double every 24 years. So when you're 54 years old, it's now $2,000. When you're 78, it's grown to 4,000. But we know that the bank doesn't just put your money in the vault, they turn around and invest it. Maybe they can get a 12% rate of return on our money that we've just given to them. At age 30, it's still $1,000. But 12 into 72 is six. So the money's gonna double every six years for the bank. So when we're 36, it's 2,000. When we're 42, it's 4,000. We turn 48, it's 8,000. 54, 16,000. Age 60, 32,000. Age 66, 64,000. Age 72, it's 128,000. And age 78, it's $254,000. Now, this is a huge difference. When we're 78 years old, we can go back to the bank and cash our account out and the bank is willing to give us the $4,000. Why? Because they just made a quarter of a million dollars. Now let's look at an example of buying a car. If you had the cash, you could trade the cash for the car, but unfortunately you have no more cash. It's gone forever and that money will never compound and grow. And the car more than likely is not going to appreciate in value. So most of us do not have the cash. We simply borrow it. We get a loan. Now let's say that we borrow $40,000 from the bank at an interest rate of 7%. The bank will loan us the money, but they say you have to pay it back over time. Let's say it's 60 months or five years. With each payment, a portion of the original loan is paid back and the interest charge. Over the course of the next 60 months in this example, you would pay $47,522. Now, this is an asset that's going to depreciate in value, but we could ask the question, what rate of return do you earn on this car? Now, it has a 7% interest rate, but the answer is zero. Why? Because this is debt. We never earn a rate of return or a positive rate of return on debt. Now, for the banker, this is not debt. This is an investment for them. So uh, remember, the original $40,000 came from where? Well, it came from me and you and all of our neighbors who went to the local bank and made those deposits. So do you see how we're part of the banking business, whether we realize it or not? But unfortunately, we're not coming up on the right side of these transactions. Let's look at buying a house. Let's say that we buy a house for half a million dollars with the same interest rate. Instead of paying it for five years, we pay it for 30 years. Again, each payment is comprised of the principal and the interest. With each payment, a part of it goes back to the original loan and the other part is the earnings for the investor. After 30 years, we would make nearly $1.2 million in payments on an original loan of a half a million dollars. So again, what rate of return do we earn on this transaction? Again, the answer is zero. Are we starting to see that almost any debt is not a good thing because we always end up getting a 0% rate of return? In fact, you could say we're getting a negative rate of return. So who wins in these investments? When you look at the transaction of buying a home, of course you need to buy a home, but the monthly payment doesn't go to you. You pay out a tremendous amount of money back to the banking institution and they receive the profit because remember originally the loan that we borrowed is made up from depositors like me and you. So how about this? Would you like to turn the tables? Wouldn't it be great if you can get a refund on all the payments on every loan that we've ever paid? Could you imagine receiving a refund of a half a million dollars or more on your home? What if you could take out the monthly payments, but instead of making them to the bank, you make them back to your own family bank. 
in this situation, we would simply leave the banking institution wondering what just happened. Now, the idea of financial independence is developing peace of mind. And we could say to you, which is more important? Is it peace of mind or is it the return on your money? One of the biggest fears that most people have as they approach the retirement age or if they're already retired is the fear of running out of money. And we would say that peace of mind really is the quality of life. When you consider our definition of having a pool of money large enough to pay for your wants, needs, and desires without depleting the pool of money, we can now see that true financial independence is achievable. Will Rogers said, I'm more concerned with the return of my money than the return on my money. And we would agree. When the stock market or the economy is negative or extremely volatile, it causes fear and panic. And that's a long way from having peace of mind, especially to those individuals who their only source of retirement or the major source of retirement is their hard-earned savings accounts. When I started out my career, I started out as a stockbroker and I learned very quickly that Wall Street doesn't care about capital preservation. They don't care about whether you lose your retirement accounts or not. Broker dealers and stockbrokers make money the old fashioned way. They're paid to risk your money. But unfortunately, most people don't understand how money works and therefore they rely on these so called advisors to make sure that their money's safe and it's growing at a good rate of return. If they understood the basics of how money works, they could understand that they're in the business of banking and they could change the situation. And so most people are simply at the mercy of whatever their retirement accounts do, whether it goes up or down. Understanding the economy is not a secret, but unfortunately it's not even taught in our schools or in our colleges. Let me give you this analogy. Let's liken the economy to this balloon. When you blow air into the balloon, it expands. When you take air out of the balloon, it contracts. Now, if you were to look at the economy, it works exactly the same way. Let's say that you have money in an economy. You put more money into it, it expands. You take money out of it, it contracts. So let's look at this analogy. At what age do we earn and spend the most money? Well, if you look at an individual just graduating from high school or college, they're not making a lot of money yet. And soon they'll graduate college, they graduate high school, they get married, uh, they find a little bit better job, and their expenses and their earning goes up a little bit. And eventually we move to another phase of our life. We start to have our families and we start to increase our expenses. We might buy a home at about this time period if we haven't already. We're starting to make a little bit more money. And then eventually we hit our peak earning capacity. And that's typically around ages 46 to 50. But also, our spending habits have also increased. Our kids are in college, they're more expensive, and so eventually we come to the point where the kids themselves, they move out of the house, we become empty nesters, and all of a sudden, our spending habits go down a little bit. And then eventually, we move into a phase where we're retired. And perhaps at that point, we, our expenses are a lot lower than what they originally were. Now, if you look at this cycle and you compare this to the balloon, you can see that the economy for this family or the spending habits for this family is this phase here is an expansion phase and this phase here is a contraction phase as it relates to spending at each stage of our lives. Now, I wanna share with you what is called the spending wave. The Spending Wave was developed by Harry S. Dent. He's the author of some great books. One of them is The Roaring Two Thousands and another one is The Great Boom Ahead. And what Harry S. Dent did is he said, just like the balloon, it's easy to predict the economy. This red background illustrates what he anticipated would happen to our economy here in the United States. And what it is is a representation of the growth of one of the largest population groups in the United States called baby boomers. These people were born between the years 1946 and 1964. And if you can see by this red background, it shows that the economy in the United States is gonna have this tremendous growth starting at around the late 1970s, early 1980s. And that is because the largest segment of our population started to graduate high school and graduate college and go into the workforce. And it would have a massive increase in our economy till about the year 2011. 
And the reason why that year was chosen is because if you do the mathematics, somebody that was born in 1946, 65 years later, is now the year 2011 and they're starting to retire. So when you have a massive group of people that are entering the workforce, they're stimulating the economy and they're saving money in their retirement accounts. But when they stop working, obviously their retirement or their spending uh, habits are going to change radically. And instead of saving money to retirement plans, they're actually going to stop working and they're now going to start to pull out of their retirement plans. So Harry S. Dan said for about 15 to 20 years, the United States is going to go through a great recession. And obviously we've started to see the effects even right now. Now this white line is actually what did happen with the overall uh, major index. Now you see a sharp dip here. This is one unexpected thing that happened. We had in 2001 the terrorist attack. Obviously that affected our economy. But also at that same time period, we had some major scandals in the stock market. The Enrons, the world comes of the world, and obvious subsequent things like Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac. All of these things helped contribute to the decline and this big downward slope in the overall market. Now what we have to be able to do is knowing all this information is this is a new economy. We cannot save money the way that our parents did or the way that our grandparents did. Simply in the new economy, a thinking person has to be able to create safety against the market volatility by using various concepts like the family bank. So you must begin to think. You must be able to think differently, but specifically about your success. Not only just your success, but your financial success. Earl Nightingale said that for most people, financial success remains a puzzle. And he's right. It's no secret that approximately 96% of all the wealth in the world is owned by only 1% of the population. So what we want to be able to do is try to break down some of the components that can make us successful in the new economy. And one of the things is this product here. It's called Fixed Equity Index Life Insurance. When you receive your personalized strategy, this is going to be one of the components that we're going to talk about, but it is one of the most powerful components as you're about to see. You see, a lot of financial advisors and people that are trying to increase their wealth, they're always evaluating the risks versus the returns. And many people are taking unnecessary risks. In fact, I could even ask them, are you trying to squeeze out a couple of extra points and risking it all on just the luck of the draw? Or do you have a system of predictability that gets the same or better results? And what I want to propose to you is that there is a way of developing a system of predictability that can get you better results than most financial advisors are offering their clients at this point in this new economy. Inside the family bank, the fixed equity index life is a universal life contract where the funds in the accumulation account are linked to the growth of an equity index, like the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, or the Dow Jones. But if you don't like those indexes, you can get even a guaranteed fixed rate of return of something like 5.5%. But there's some other features. First of all, and most importantly, is you get principal guarantees, which means that the value of your account is never subject to any risk in the market. Also, any growth that you experience has what is called an annual lock-in of the index gains, and therefore it resets the principal guarantee. Also, we have a minimum rate of return if the overall economy or the index that you happens to choose is negative. So if you don't choose the fixed guaranteed rate of 5.5%, and the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones happens to be negative, don't worry about it. Not only is your value protected, but you're guaranteed to get a minimum rate of return of 1 to 3%. Now, the downside to this strategy is there is a maximum cap on the gains. So, for example, if the S&P 500 happens to have more than a 17% rate of return, you may be limited to some type of ceiling or some type of cap. And it could be anywhere from... 14, 15, 16, 17, or 18 percent. Now, in my experience, on average, the S&P 500 
doesn't earn those high rate of returns. It's typically earning anywhere from 7, 8, 9% rate of return. But also, now that you understand the concept of the family bank and how loans work and how bankers make money off of the interest they charge on their loans, since you have your own family bank, you are the owner, you're the boss, you can actually set up contractual, no-cost loans to yourself. Now let me give you an example of the lock-in and the reset of the S&P 500. Let's say that you have $100,000. This might be in an IRA, a 401k, a SEP IRA, or even a life insurance policy. Let's say that the overall account earns 10%, meaning that the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones went up 10%. Using simple interest, the account value grew to be worth $110,000. Now, this gain becomes the new principle. Now, if your money is subject to market volatility, where, where it's in a regular mutual fund or a regular sub-account, it is subject to losses. Let's assume that the next year you lose 10%. What is the new value? You went up 10, now you go down 10. Are you where you started or are you lower? You see, if you have a higher dollar amount and you lose the same rate of return that you earned the previous years, your account value is lower than what you originally started with. But if you are using one of our strategies and chose an account that has a fixed lock-in and reset of the S&P 500, you do not lose money. In fact, you'll earn some minimum rate of return. In this example, it's 1%. So while the rest of the individuals that have stock market based accounts that are subject to their losses you didn't participate in those losses you actually had a growth then if the next year the market had a positive rate of return say five percent your starting point in regular funds is ninety nine thousand dollars but with a fixed equity index account it's a hundred and eleven thousand one hundred dollars so in this short example this is a thirteen percent difference Imagine if you could go back in all the years that you've been saving money, you never participated in any of the losses. How much further ahead would you be today than you actually are? In this example, it's a $12,750 difference because of the annual lock-in and reset. Now, if you look at the comparison between regular funds and a fixed equity index account, there's a huge difference, and I'm looking at the years 1999 to 2004. I chose this time period to give you an example. If in 2000, 2001, and 2002, we had negative years. This has only happened twice in our U.S. history where we had three negative back-to-back -back years. The other time was the Great Depression. But within this example, $100,000 following the S&P 500 market, six years later, you averaged a 0.34%. It's not even a half a percent rate of return. Your value is just a little over 103000 But at the same time, inflation rate could easily continue to be an average of 3%. But if you then look at the Equity Index Universal Life, which is a life insurance policy that one must pay for the cost of insurance, you could see that our $100,000 did not ever become subject to the losses of the market. In fact, each and every year you had some positive growth. Now, at the end of the six year period, look at the difference. You have $151,783 in this example, even after paying for the cost of the insurance, at the same time your average was 7.42%. Now, when we run your personal calculations, I use an average rate of return of about 8%. That is because I want to be a little bit more conservative than what the actual market has already been. But you can see here that even if 50% of the time is negative in this example, you still have a very good positive rate of return. Now, a lot of people over the years have asked me to show them what has the market actually done over a longer period. If you go from 1990 to 2004, the average has been 9.91%. If you go back 30 years, it's 9.61%. So you can see that if we were to use an 8% rate of return running calculations, we're going to be a little bit more conservative. Now, this next portion here is a formula. 1 plus 2 equals 3. Inside of the fixed equity index universal life insurance contracts, there are three components that I want to talk about. One, 
is the cash value, two is the face amount, and three is the death benefit. Now, these are called increasing policies because the only thing that is fixed is the face amount. Your cash value will continue to grow and get larger based upon how much you want to save in your family bank and the growth of the account. That plus a fixed face amount equals some type of death benefit. If we add some numbers to this, say we have $100,000 plus a million dollar insurance policy equals a total death benefit of $1.1 million. And as time goes on, you can see that the only thing that increases in this example is the cash value. But the cash value plus the fixed face amount gives us a higher death benefit continually. But these policies have one unique feature, and this is why they're part of the family bank and why we talked about the banking industry in the beginning. is because it has a feature that allows you to tote tax-free loans from the account. If we then look at some numbers again, the 500000 plus the $1 million equaling a total death benefit of $1.5 million, let's say now you have a need to borrow money. Let's say that you want to buy a new house, and the house is $300,000. But instead of financing this, you actually get a loan from your own family bank. Now, the loan when you get it from an insurance company in this particular policy, and I have to repeat this, only in this type of policy, you have the ability to actually loan the money against the death benefit. In fact, I could even say that there are 21 insurance companies in the United States that I know of that offer a fixed equity index universal life account, but only a couple of them allow you to collateralize that loan without depleting the cash value. You can collateralize that loan against the death benefit. Now, since this is a loan, you do have to pay it back. But when do you pay it back? Well, the answer is when you die. Since it's collateralized against the death benefit, you have to pay this back to the insurance company upon your death. That may be 10 years, 20 years, 50 years from now. And all that happens is the insurance company will take back their $300,000 and your beneficiaries will see, receive the net difference. Now, you can see how this ties into the family bank. Let's say that you want to buy that car again. Well, instead of borrowing the money, you just have the money in your own account first and then borrow that $40,000 out. If you have a half million dollar home and you have a half million dollars in your account, you can conceivably borrow it out from your own family bank in order to do this. Now, let me give you another example. Okay, this is a spreadsheet. It's going to illustrate the numbers that we were just talking about. Now, let's say that you have a half a million dollars in your account. Maybe it's taken you a couple years to save up to this, maybe 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or maybe you have the money right now. But let's say that this half a million dollars is your cash value. You have a $1 million face amount and you have a death benefit. In this scenario, I'm assuming that you have stopped all contributions to the account. You're not contributing anymore. So you can see that if we had a simple 8% average rate of return, the account grows by 8%. As the cash value grows, you add that to the fixed face amount and therefore your death benefit increases. But let's also say that you want to take out some loans. Let's take out $300,000 as we did in our previous example. If I have a $300,000 loan and I'm not going to pay this back, we're going to leave it outstanding. And you see that the net death benefit is lowered by $300,000. That is because the loan does have to be paid back. But the point I want to illustrate here is your cash value did not even become affected because of the $300,000 loan. You see, after 20 years, your account value still continued to grow in this example to be worth $2.2 million. Now, if you had to liquidate $300,000 like you do in an IRA or 401k, Roth IRA, or even a bank account, that $300,000 is going to change your account. In fact, if you had $500,000 and you took out $300,000, you now only have $200,000 left. And what I want to do is show you the power of compound interest. If you liquidate your money, that money is never going to compound and grow. And the, the important part about investing is not the contributions that you make. But it is the growth on the contributions and the growth on that money and that money and that money. If you liquidate your funds, 
look how it affects your future retirement. You see, by liquidating accounts, you are subjecting yourself to the possibility of running out of money. But with a fixed equity index, you can actually b put money into the account, borrow it out at a later date in the form of a collateralized loan against the death benefit, and never touch your cash value. When you receive your personalized financial strategy, this is going to be one of the most important concepts that you'll be able to see. So I hope you've enjoyed this overview of the Family Bank, and hopefully you'll look forward to receiving your personalized strategy in the mail soon. And as we finish here, I want to leave you again with the impression of the definition of financial independence. It's having a pool of money large enough to produce an income stream to pay for your wants, needs, and desires without depleting the pool of money. And you can see now that maybe for the first time there is an account out there or there is an option out there where you can protect your money from market volatility. You can actually get a good rate of return in a negative economy. And most importantly, you can have an account unlike an IRA, a 401k, or even a bank account that you can keep your money without depleting the pool of money by taking out loans in the form of collateralizing that against a death benefit. When you receive your personalized strategy, the plan summary will include items like improving your cash flow. If you run a business, how you can maximize your income and minimize your expenses. How you can reduce probate costs and court costs by 5 to 10% of the gross value of your estate. How you can increase tax deductions. How you can reduce and manage your self-employment taxes if you're self-employed. How you can minimize credit or exposure on the value of your real estate assets and other interests. How you can eliminate unnecessary estate taxes, thus increasing the value of your estate, leaving to your heirs. Also, with the fixed equity index strategies, you can improve your net rate of return on guaranteed investments by an average of 4%, thus increasing your overall net retirement income. So once again, I want to thank you for participating in this part one presentation of the Family Bank. If you have any questions, we look forward to talking to you soon.